James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1. It might be a simple sermon, but very difficult to apply. The Lord laid this on my heart. James is one of the closest uh, apostles of Jesus Christ. You might recall that he was one of the trio that followed along Jesus Christ whenever he wanted three particular disciples. It was Peter, John, and James, the younger brother. When Jesus ascended to heaven, James became one of those pillars within Christianity. James <clears throat> suffered much persecution. As a matter of fact, we do know that he was imprisoned for his faith and later killed for his faith. If you know the history of James, James, he was always impulsive. He was short-tempered. He never had any patience. But the Lord Jesus Christ ordained him specifically to undergo trial, pain, and suffering to teach him patience. So James is telling us his experience of how he learned patience. In James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, <clears throat> count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Have you undergone a temptation and a trial in your life? And I preach so many sermons on that one. But it bears repeating how many times in this year and last year have we undergone so many trials and sufferings and temptations. And then the tendency in our heart is actually the right kind of spirit. It's not like any of you get bitter and mad at God immediately. It's not like any of you will sin immediately. You all just hang on to your faith, because that's all you can do. And you just keep coming to church. You just keep singing those hymns. You just keep reading the Word of God. You just keep praying. You just keep staying away from any sin and temptation out there. Sure, let's be honest, we have a history of falling, but in this church, we pick ourselves back up. We pick ourselves back up. We just pick ourselves back up, come into church as if nothing happened because it's covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we sing and shout when we sing songs like, it's under the blood. Did you ever wonder why? Because I'm a witness, bless God. And God covered me, and I'm one of those that just pick myself back up. And as I undergo another trial and another temptation, I just get it covered under the blood, pick myself back up. And like Bob Jones Sr. said, get my shoes, meaning I'm going to preach on the pulpit. So I just get my shoes and come to church and preach to y'all. And just like you, we just sing, we just shout, we just fellowship, we just listen to the preaching of the Word of God. And that's all we can do. And for years, this church has always had a history of suffering and pain. And we just pick ourselves back up. We just shout it out. We just soldier on for God. Our church has always had a history. And that's all we could do. That's all we could do. But in the middle of that pain, a hundred times, this thought has always occurred in your mind. Lord, isn't this enough? When will it end? Lord, haven't I already experienced enough and you taught me enough and I've changed and I've surrendered that to you. What more do you want from me? How many times have we thought, Lord, I'm trying to understand why this occurred and I'm trying to follow your will every step of the way and I'm so afraid that I'm going to mess up. I'm afraid that this temptation and trial will overwhelm me. God, it's greater than I can bear. Lord, how much longer can I take? Oh God, help me. Lord, why are you trying to teach me? And one thing we humans have learned is that we can't figure out God, even no matter how much you try to figure him out 
So and that during those times, there is one thing that can help you. This is that sermon that I hope will help you when you undergo through these things and when you're in those gritting your teeth moments. In those moments, those doubts flood your mind and you don't shed tears here and you don't whine about your pain, but I know you do in your own homes. And when you do that, I want you to remember this sermon right here, what James is trying to tell you. Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood and make this sermon reach the hearts of the people and help them. Father God, I, I really don't think that I can help much, but Lord, you've taught me over and over again that you can help them. So Lord, you have to intervene. You have to help them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in the first verse, notice that it says, James, a sermon of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. You will hear most Bible believers say that this verse will show that the entire book of James is addressed to the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, the Jews. And you will notice that the context is full of tribulation context. By the way, I just want to give a disclaimer. So there's something wrong with our thermostat. So if you are feeling hot, you're feeling the right feelings, actually. It is hot. AC's not working. We have no idea what's going on. So I'm just giving you a heads up. That way you can mentally prepare yourselves and try to endure through the sermon. And then that way you don't miss out some preaching that could help you, all right? All right, so just... Giving you guys heads up on that, all right? All right. But Bible believers have always taken it to account that this is a given. It's written to Jews in the tribulation. But I think it's more so than that. I think it's more so than that. The verse says 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. You ever wonder why it says scattered abroad? Well, you and, my, you and I might think, well, it's because those Jews are all scattered everywhere, obviously. During those days, Jews had difficulty tracing their lineage because they lost their nation. The Roman Empire conquered them, and those Jews were scattered out throughout the whole world. You know the history of the Jews. That's always been their case. So they don't know which tribe they come from. Well, that's a given. But remember, James is writing here. What time period is he at? He's at the time period of the early Acts. So maybe the early Acts will give us a clue what this means. So go to the book of Acts. Chapter, I think, 8. Go to the book of Acts. And we'll go to chapter 8. During the early time of the book of Acts, the preaching was first directed to Jews. Remember that? Yeah. There was no Pauline gospel. There was no, basically, Christian doctrine set into place. The preaching and the focus <clears throat> was toward a Jewish audience here. And James was at contemporary that time with those Jews in the early Acts. So this will make a lot of sense. And what happened that time? At verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all what? Scattered, Scattered abroad. That's why James would write down to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. That's why they were preaching, teaching, end times. If you know the timeline of the early Acts, it was a kingdom that they were waiting for. They were preaching about tribulation doctrine and times and to a Jewish audience. So it makes a lot of sense why James wrote, wrote it that way at James 1.1. 1, 1, to the 12 tribes, a Jewish audience, not the Christian church during the Apostle Paul's days when he was revealed the body of Christ, but before then, James wrote it to those Jews that are scattered abroad. Now, you know what was going on? It was against the church at Jerusalem. 
Do you know what was going on at the church at Jerusalem? If you look at Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, they had a revival. The Holy Spirit was moving. Souls were getting saved. People were getting added to the church daily. They were praising God. They were shouting the victory. They had the fruits, the fruits which every child of God wants in their lives, right? That's something that you and I want, the fruits. Well, they got at that church. The Bible says in verse 47, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Oh, God kept blessing them. He was pouring down showers of blessings. He filled up every seat in that pew. In fact, they couldn't have a building. They had to do it everywhere in the city of Jerusalem. The word of God was increasing, prevailing, and man, they had revival. They were gleaning the fruits. They had the time of their lives, just like any of us would want right now. And you know what God did after they got all the fruits? After they got all the fruits, he sent in persecution. He had to send in pain in the middle of gaining fruits. Lord, haven't we suffered enough? I mean, we were in fear when you got resurrected. Lord, we were the 12 disciples that had no uh, pillow for a head but a stone. Three and a half years we were wandering around. God, haven't we suffered enough? Lord, the Pharisees, the Jews, they kept persecuting us. Lord, haven't we been persecuted enough? Lord, we went through a very dark moment when you were crucified on the cross. Lord, we forsook family. We forsook forsook friends, and you said that when we did that, that we would have more in this life and the hereafter. God, haven't we done enough? Lord, now you bless this church with so much fruit because we've overcome. We've overcame the trial. We overcame the tribulation, and we worked so hard to get here, so why would you now destroy and scatter all the fruits everywhere? After we worked so hard to get here, with all the fruits. See, you would think that once you get the fruits, you reach the end, right? Because you labored hard enough, you forsook enough, you changed enough of yourself to surrender to God and commit your life to Jesus Christ. But see, disciple, forsaking those fishing nets, forsaking houses and family, that was not enough. That wasn't enough. True, you worked so hard to get the fruit that you got, right? God gave you much fruit. And the most unfair, the most mean thing that he could do after you worked so hard to get that fruit is to scatter it. You felt like that? I endured enough, Father. I suffered enough. And Lord, I got the fruit. Now you blessed me with the fruit and put it in my hand and now you take it away. Didn't, didn't gaining the fruit meant that I've overcome? That I passed the lesson? That I passed the fire? And now I can enjoy the blessing? No, he could take it away again. After you worked so hard, after you changed everything about yourself, committed your life to Jesus Christ, he can take it away again. Because the Lord gave and the Lord take it away. It doesn't say the Lord take away and gave. He can give you the fruit after you worked so hard, after you served him, lived your life. And he'll, he can get it back, take it away from you. That church was increasing with so much fruit, mighty for God, and the worst thing that can happen, God had to give split churches, scatter them. Why? James was writing about that time. They're all scattered. And they worked so hard to get here. After they worked so hard, and James worked so hard as a disciple of Jesus Christ, where he forsook everything, he forsook his only job, he forsook his fishing nets, and then he went through three and a half years of poverty, homelessness with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He suffered criticism from the Pharisees and Sadducees. Wasn't he persecuted? Hasn't he suffered enough? So why does he now have to go through another suffering? 
another trial period. God, I am sick and tired. Why would you do that? James right when you look at verse 2, 3, and 4 that we read, it's so that God can bless you, give you a better one. You know what was better for that church? Yeah, they were growing so much with fruits, which is why God says you're so fruitful. Now that needs to be broken again. That needs to be taken away from you so you can produce more fruit. So he scattered the church, and guess what? That made Christianity spread out even more. Otherwise, they would have been stuck at Jerusalem, and that would have been it. And worldwide, it would have been pervasive with Roman paganism. But you know what happened? Because the Christians kept getting persecuted, they kept scattering, 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 and the fruit spread out everywhere. You know why the Lord took away your fruit? Because you are fruitful. You're producing much fruit. And you're getting blessed by God, so God needs to scatter you again. And he needs to break you again so that you can give out more fruits to other people who will need that. So you can give out more fruits for those souls that you've been praying for every day to get saved. So that those fruits can spread out because of the Bay Area and the world that you've been praying for, that they would be ministered Bible-believing truth. The Lord scattered and broke your fruit because there are more people out there that your life can minister to. Amen. That's why the Lord, he'll bless you with much fruit and increase you so that the fruit that grows so big, it's got to be cut to pieces so that the benefit can spread out more. A lot of people don't understand that's how God works, is that when God blesses your life, and when you go through trial and suffering, you go through a trying period, testing period, and then finally you got the fruit, and the biggest mistake Christians think after that is, it's over. Yeah. I got the fruit. This is for keeps. See? Do you understand? We worked hard to get here, right? but God could take it away again. You worked hard to get where you're at. You prayed hard to get where you're at, right? You labored hard to get where you're at, and God blessed it to you. But know this, what you have in your hand, brother and sister in Christ, is not for keeps. It can be taken away again. That's one thing you need to understand about suffering and tribulation is that God can bless you with so much fruit and then scatter it again. Verse 2, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The author writes that it will be all joy when you fall into many kinds of temptations. When you and I would read that verse, we would say amen to it and we would try to say that's why we got to put all of our joy, all of our happiness into, no, into any kind of trial and testing that we go through. So we try to put our emotion into it. We try to put it all joy. We try to rejoice evermore no matter what the pain, what the suffering is because we got to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. But let's be honest feels like we're faking it and you and I it feels like we're just trying to make ourselves happy when we're genuinely not happy as we fall into suffering and affliction but pastor that verse is counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations I'm wondering if it has a different interpretation to it I wonder if we looked at it wrong, maybe. Maybe it's not counted all joy. Maybe the joy is not supposed to be the one that's all, but more so of count what? It. Is that what it said? What is it? It's that situation of falling into all sorts of temptations. 
That verse is saying, count it, the falling into diverse temptations, all, it all. What does that mean then? It all means every single one of those temptations. Every single one of those afflictions and painful moments that you go through. God says, count every one of those things, not the joy. So all is not for the joy. It's for all those other temptations and trials that you go through. Count all those things to be joy itself. So when Paul says, sorrowing yet always rejoicing, he understands that when you're trying to find joy in the Lord, it doesn't have to be 100% joy. It's not something you can... Make it 100%. Come on, how can you call it 100% joy when you have someone close that you deeply love and depend upon suddenly die in front of you? Then that's very abnormal. But isn't there a joyous situation in that loved one's death if that loved one is saved and we know that he or she is in heaven? So in situations like that, temptations, trials like that, because James said, it all, every one of the difficult times you go through, those things are the all. All those things, any one of them, you can find joy in it. And that's why it makes sense you can be sad. It's okay to be sad in a funeral because he or she is your loved one that is no longer with you but you can still find joy in that. You don't have to make it 100% joy. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying in situations even like that, you can find joy. So there are two emotions then. It's not 100% joy and zero sorrow. It's sorrow and joy. That's normal in funerals. Now it makes sense what Paul says, yet being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. See, he had those two emotions. And I think that's the reason why during a trial and affliction, it's really hard to be joyous, to be happy if you're just forcing it. You can't make yourself 100% joyous. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be in bitterness it's okay to pour out your complaint to the Lord because the psalmist did that, because God wants that. The Bible says, boldly approach to the throne of grace that you might find help, grace to help in time of need. That's okay. Don't needlessly pressure yourself to force yourself into some fake joy in some trial or pain it's okay to pour out the complaint to the Lord it's okay to put your tears in his bottle it's okay to be sorrowful in pain because that's just normal for everyone but P.S. know that God will work it for good but P.S., know that there's joy in that, that God will bring you something better. There's gladness in the middle of that sorrow, knowing that Jesus Christ is on the throne and he's in charge and he's our intercessor and he's our high priest and he's ministering to our needs and he feeleth our infirmities and that's why even in situations like that, all, all, any and every situation and sorrow you go through, there's joy. So when you're feeling suffering and pain and you just feel so bad that all you can feel is woe and sorrow, it's okay. But know that there's joy in that too. You got to put some joy in there, see. If you got no joy in there, then you know you're wrong. So put joy in there. Whenever you pour out your complaint or you're sorrowful, put a P.S. Okay. Put a P.S. But I know that I'm wrong, God, and you're right. That's a good P.S. But I know that you know better than I do. 
put a PS. God, I don't want this thing to happen. But I know that I might regret saying that later on. And I prefer your way. See, put a P.S. of a joyous thing, what God promised you in His book as you undergo sorrow. I want you to turn to 1 Peter 1. That's very important. I, there's a good wording there that I want you to see when you go through temptations. This matches pretty well with uh, James, how he words it. Go to 1 Peter 1. The Apostle Peter is covering the same subject in the first chapter, just like James, because he is undergoing the suffering and persecution like the Apostle James. So they are writing about the same thing right here. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, wherein he greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in, see that? Heaviness. Through what? Manifold temptations. And look at James 1, 2. Don't you think it's pretty much the same thing that they're both saying? Yep. Same thing. No matter what temptation or trial you go through, we can find joy in it. So put a P.S. And by the way, it's okay to have what Peter called it heaviness. Yep. Heaviness. You feel that when you're going through the pain and you're gritting your teeth and you're lying on your bed and your mind is racking and tears are falling out of your eyes and all you can do is just breathe and you're just trying to breathe and you're saying, God, I can't do it anymore. You feel that? That's natural. That's normal. But P.S., there's an end. But P.S., God will work it for good. But P.S., I'm going to forget what I cried about. P.S., joy, joy, and joy. That's what the writers are trying to tell you. Why? Why can I be happy? You don't really study that P.S., do you? In every single one of those P.S., you know what it, it translates to? Basically, it's translating for you that it's something good for you. Correct? Every single one of those P.S. that you give with joy, it translates to, the meaning is, it's something good for you. So you know what Peter says? I like this. But my flesh don't like it. It says, Wherein he greatly rejoiced, though now for a season, what? If need be. You know why that heaviness is there? Not because you want it, because you need it. I need it. You know what? You and I don't think we need it. But see, that's your flesh talking. You know who's talking inside you? I need it. You know who's saying, I need to suffer with Jesus Christ. I need to crucify the flesh and resurrect the spirit. Suffering is good for me. Affliction is good for me. So that I can finally grow. Growing pains hurt. They hurt so much. But I need it. I want to grow. And that is your spirit sealed within you till the day you die or you get raptured. I don't want it. I don't want it. That's okay. That's your flesh talking. Yeah. But deep down inside, maybe you're denying it. Okay. Yeah. And that's your flesh. But your spirit is saying, it's good for me. Yeah. And your spirit says, I need more of it. I'm growing. I'm growing. Give it to me. God, I've grown my fruit and you scattered me again because I'm still growing. That's why God puts you to affliction, blesses you with fruit, and then takes away the fruit. Scatter that fruit. Yeah. 
seems to destroy that fruit. But what that is is another trial that's producing more fruit. That's what it is again. Why? I don't want it. I don't want it. That's your flesh talking. But see, your spirit's saying, I want more. I need more. I need to produce more fruit. Give me, give me, give me. I know you hate that. I know you hate that. But look, when you sing those hymns, no matter how much your flesh feels heavy, there's a part of you that really likes those words. Look, you're just lying to yourself. You're in denial. I think I need to preach. I, I feel like there's some in denial right here. And God wants me to preach on this just a little harder. When you look at those hymns and when you sing tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day, day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong. But farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. Try as you might in your flesh, there's something in you that can't help but says, I like that. Yeah. I like that song. Yeah. No, I hate that song. It's a miserable song. Tempted and tried, we're off made to... Who likes that song? That's your spirit. Yes, sir. Yeah. He wants more. Yeah. You know why you like this preaching? I never said God was going to give you prosperity. Okay. Take away the pain. I never promised you comfort. So y'all should hate this sermon. Some of you should have got offended and walked away. Some of you should be bitter. Maybe some of you are. But ain't there something inside you that just says, preach on that, park on that. You're giving me something. I'm breathing finally. I'm growing. And God is ministering to me. Your spirit in you has been crying out ever since and says, give me more. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12. You remember that verse? Paul says, there's a thorn in my what? Flesh. So it hates it. But he says, therefore I take pleasure. I find joy. And he said, I prefer to have that thorn in my flesh so that the power of Christ can rest upon me. So you know what that means? That means there's a spirit inside him. And that spirit craves for the power of Jesus Christ. A closer relationship with him. To draw closer to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And try as you may, might. Some of you have already talked about I'm quitting Christianity. Some of you said that I'm sick and tired of being a Bible believer. I can't fight anymore. God, I want it to end. And you're such a big hypocrite when Vince Massa sings, I'm going to die on the battlefield and you run bases you know why you're such a hypocrite you're such a living contradiction that was your spirit just now and you love those kind of songs you love it I know there's a part of you that hates it right now but that's your flesh but there's a part of you that's saying come on preach on that a little more I'm going to die on the battlefield. I'm going to die in the war. I'm going to die on the battlefield with glory yeah. in my soul. Yeah. You like those songs. You don't like songs with, you know, like this, and saying, God will make me rich again. Yay, yay. Oh, Jesus, shalom, shalom. Hallelujah, yes, you are. Y'all don't like that. Y'all don't like that. But that's supposed to make your flesh feel good. That's supposed to make you comfortable. That's supposed to make you rich. There's nothing negative about it. So why in the world there's something inside you that craves, that craves for persecution, for fighting, for war, for blood, and for the flesh to die, and for crucifixion, crucifixion, where, why, it's that spirit inside you. Because it's crying out, I need more. Because don't forget verse 1. Your fruit is growing. It wants to be scattered and produce more fruit. 
What did the Bible say? Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and what? See, it produced fruit, but it got killed again. God took it away again. But it says, but after it dies, it brings forth much fruit. See, that's why God takes away your fruit. He's trying to produce more. I need it. See that? You and I need, you and I need this. That thorn in our flesh, we need that. There's a part of you that is crying out, give me. Because your spirit's growing. Look, if you know this much already, you can't take it back. You heard too much preaching. You got too much Holy Spirit conviction. I mean, how can you go back after that? There's no way you can hide this out. You can't help but cry out more. Can't help but cry out, this is good for me. You can't help but cry out, I need this. In verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. James says that when you go through all sorts of trials and afflictions, we do know that all those things are intended to try, to test our faith in God. And when it tests our faith in God, it worketh. That means it's operating, it's processing, it's enacting and commencing the fruit of not more people in church. The fruit of, finally, the trial is gone and God can give me true relief. What it's producing is patience. Not blessings from God. Not the fruits that you think of. It's patience. That's what tribulation is trying to produce that fruit. But see, who loves patience? No, what, a, what a treat God gives to us. I mean, that's a mean, that's a terrible thing to do. Imagine that God afflicted you like he did with Job, and you went through affliction, 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 and in the end, he didn't twice bless you. And he says, well, no, I, I taught you patience, so that's your fruit. You should be happy. That's a horrible God. That's a mean God. Lord, I mean, I'm spiritual, but I ain't that spiritual. I think there's something wrong right here. This doesn't seem right. Well, let's say this. Do you know there are two words that people do not like in this verse? Let's get rid of those two words and see how it will turn out. Knowing this, that the comforting, the easing of your faith worketh impatience. Does that sound better? Look, if you don't want the trying, then what's the opposite of trying? It's easing. If you don't want the patience, what's the opposite of patience? Impatience. You know how God can make you impatient? If he gave you and answered you every time you wanted it. Every time you want it, God gave it to you at the right feeling, at the right moment that you want it. That's how you become impatient. So why didn't God give it to you when you wanted it? When you think you need it. Because it'll produce impatience. Lord, why do I have to go through trying? Why does my faith have to be tried? Why can't my faith be boosted, inspired? Why can't my faith be motivated? Why can't my faith be eased? Lord, oh, why does it have to be tried? Well, look at the world. What happened to the world when they live in a world of motivation in their sermons? 
inspirational messages. When they have coddling people, people who coddle them or ease the members, then what happens to them? Ungrateful, complaining, griping, spoiled, and if the smallest persecution or the smallest discomfort would happen, does God even exist? I thought God was a good God. I'm going to be atheist. Your faith gets destroyed easily. That's why God don't coddle you. He tests you. That's why God don't comfort you. He afflicts you. That's the reason why God don't inspire or motivate your faith. He puts a lot of pressure and wait for you to build up your faith. Just like any physical exercise that needs it. It needs the resistance, it needs the pressure, it needs the push for those muscles to just burn and burn and burn in pain until it can just build up. Lord, why, why can't you take it away? Lord, haven't I done enough? Then you want impatience. That's what you want. Do you know what you're asking for? If God gave you what you want every time. You know what you're asking for? Impatience. Think of a life. Think of a life where you always had impatience. Do you honestly think you'll be happy for the rest of your life? Think of the richest people who have the easiest access, quicker ways of living. They're happy, you think? What guarantees happiness? Patience. Why? Because it's because it gets easier, it makes you more happy when your body and mind, listen, when your body, soul, and spirit, your mental condition, your emotional condition, your physical di- condition, it's easier for it if it learn to adapt through pain, accept hardness and learn to manage it, learn to make those things better, your mental state, your emotional state, your physical well-being will improve a lot better than for your mental state, your emotional state, and your physical state to be coddled and coddled and coddled and make sure that this bad thing don't happen and that bad thing don't happen to it and that bad thing don't happen to it and that environmental factor doesn't happen and that genetic defect don't happen to you and all those things are out of the way, then the smallest pain that were to happen to you you will crash, burn, and die and think it's the end of the world. That's good. But if all these pains were things that you're so used to going through and managing, then let them come. It's not going to phase you then. What's that thing that you desperately need then where those things come at you and they don't phase you? Patience. The most valuable gift God will ever give to you more than giving you a billion dollars and blessing your life is the gift of patience. Because he can bless your life just like the nation of Israel and you will whine and you will complain and you will get discontent and you will lust after the world, covet those other nations, want a king like every other nation, worship Baal and even burn babies to Moloch. The most valuable blessing and gift God can give to you is patience more than any physical, physical blessing that he'll give to you. And maybe even heavenly. Patience is the most blessed thing that he can ever give to you. Patience teaches you to look through the doom and gloom and learn to live and be happy with it. 
to find joy, to learn to enjoy life, to surrender problems and pressure to truly in the hand of God and not on your own hands. That's what patience teaches. Yes, she's a valuable gift. By the way, in the book of Matthew chapter 13, if you look at that parable, didn't the Bible say that when the sower went to scatter the seeds, there was much fruit? Much fruit. That's what you and I want, right? Much fruit. God, we want fruit from our ministry. Bless us with much fruit. The verse says much fruit with patience. You know what the gift of patience is? It's not just a teacher to help you to live happy with problems and sorrow, but it does give you those blessings as well. Even physical. That's what patience gift is. It's not just for you to accept the pain and sorrow, learn to manage it, make it better, and you can live to be happy, but also it gives you extra benefits of blessings. Those were the fruits your flesh longed for all that time. Those were the physical things that your flesh yearned for all that time. But see, the flesh needs to get out of, that, out of the way first to get what you want. That flesh must die and patience must have her victory for you to get all those wonderful things from God. The most blessed gift that you'll ever get from pain and pain and pain again is patience. Verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's true. If patience is able to have her perfect work, her perfect process, then she'll give you whatever. See, basically the sky is the limit and Gives you all kinds of blessings from God. As Jesus said in the parable, when the sower scattered out those seeds, it brought forth much, much fruit, hundredfold, hundredfold with patience. That's the perfect fruit of patience. But you know what I think this verse is talking about? I don't think it's talking about all those fruits for its perfect work. I think fruits are inclusive. Don't get me wrong. It is inclusive. But I think it's something more specific here. I think that when the Bible says, let patience have her perfect work, it's not that you get a hundredfold of God's blessings and then you're thankful like Job. Lord, you blessed me twice more than I had originally. Thank you so much for all these fruits. I don't think that's what the verse is talking about. I think the verse puts all those things as, yeah, it's, it's great that you get blessed twice and you get a hundred full blessings. Wonderful thing, but that's just the side. That's just on the side. There's something more important that patience does. Did you notice how personal that verse is? If you look at that, how personal it is. But let patience have her perfect work that what? Ye. Ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Notice right here it has to do with your spiritual walk. When God afflicts my life, I know I'm going to have much fruit out of that, but it sure discourages me as if I keep seeing empty seats, if I see people leave, if I go through money problems and it starts dropping, or when I'm starting to produce fruit from this ministry and all of a sudden those things get stolen or split or ruined by other people. I know when I go through affliction, I'll get much fruit, but when I see those fruits like 
verse 1 said, scattered. See, God cut it off and he took it away, what he gave to me. And that discourages me. Then I'll never think, listen, then I'll never think that those tribulations or trials are truly for my betterment if God keeps taking away those fruits that I have. And that seems to be the case, I don't know, with any of you. Then maybe God has the affliction for a different fruit. It's your spiritual walk with him. See, we're so concentrated on fruits, 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 fruits. But the most important fruit that you forgot is singular. Can you guess? Oh, if we were to rewind a couple books previously, there's an apostle named Paul who wrote to the Galatians. And he was writing a whole chapter about spiritual walk. About the flesh not having its way and victory in our lives. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. But the fruit. Singular. Of the spirit is God finally answered my prayers. Woo! Nope. But the fruit is, more people came to our church. Bless God. No. But the fruit is, man, so many souls got saved. Amen. No. But the fruit is, God gave me a hundredfold blessings. No. But the fruit is, love. Joy. Peace. Peace. But God, if you give me that thing that I want, then I'll have peace. No, 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 wrong fruit child. You think it's the thing, not the peace. You confuse peace with that thing you want. Can I repeat that again? You confuse the thing that you want with peace. And God says, peace, long suffering. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith. Oh, God, it's so hard through the storm. Take away the storm and I will believe that you are real and you're a great God and you can take me through the storm. No, oh, you confuse faith with God taking away the storm. Faith! Meekness, temperance. Against such, listen, do you know the weight of this? Against such, if you're to have all that in, which is a singular fruit, and that's your spiritual walk. If you get your spiritual state, your, if you get your spiritual state fixed, your mental condition, mental instability, emotional instability is fixed. Your fleshly feelings that are all over the floor is fixed. If you have your spiritual state fixed and fixed, and that spiritual state is fixed based on that singular fruit, against such, there is no law. Do you know how powerful that meaning is? That means if you have this fruit, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing in this world. No law in this world. No other law from God that can contradict it. You just have this, you immediately follow the law of God. All other laws in this natural universe will bend and fall on its knees to that fruit. Against such, there is no law. So you want that car that you always wanted and that's going to fix all the laws of the universe, you think? It'll die out according to the second law of thermodynamics. You want that job that you always wanted and you think that's the fruit and that'll solve all your problems? <laughs> You're just one out of a million and billions where they're going to take away that job and give it to another person. And that job can only fill your belly, friend. 
That's the best it can ever do for you. No law of nature will bend its knees on it. You're bound by the laws of economics in that case. You think getting what you want is going to solve all your problems. That God's going to take away that pain. He's going to solve all your problems. No, you, you'll fall whim to the laws of anything in this world. But you get that fruit of the Spirit, nothing is going to get you out of that big state. And no persecution or affliction on this earth is going to make you shake away from that very foundation. And maybe you'll understand why those martyrs were able to sing and praise Jesus Christ while being burned at the stake. Then you'll maybe understand that what they got is much better than what you got in your nice, comfortable, air-conditioned home with two vehicles and money to keep you going and a nice job and a nice church and a nice area with fun things, with the TV and extra furniture! That's, I think, a perfect work from patience is that fruit of the Spirit. Do you know how many Bible-believing Christians, I would dare say 90% of them, and maybe even pastors, because I'm guilty myself, are working so hard to get fruits, 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 and they got it. They, they lost their most valuable fruit. And there are pastors with filled pews and seats who have no peace and joy of God in their hearts. And there are evangelists preaching the word of God with such Holy Spirit unction and power and get the altars filled and their hearts have or lack love, the fruit of love in their hearts. You want what they got then? Is that the fruits you want? Or you want the fruit? You know, James once says <clears throat> something more specifically. It's more so than your spiritual state. It's more so than your spiritual well-being. It's more so than your spiritual walk. This verse is so personal. It says when patients have a perfect work, it's not, the fruits are not even mentioned here or a singular fruit. It says, but let patients have a perfect work that what? He, it's even more personal. It's just you. The real you. Not the fake you that's crying, whining, complaining, and fussing, and want every comfort in life. That ain't the real you. That's just your stinking, rotten flesh. The real you is the one that is desperately crying and waiting for so many years for the fruit of the Spirit. And I think that's the case when you'll notice right here that you are a fruit, believe it or not. Because if you look at verse 18, verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That is you and me, amen? You and me got born again, got saved by the word of God that we should be a what? Kind of first fruits of his creatures. You know what the most important fruit is? You. That's how love, joy, and peace can come out of your life. It's you that needs the fruit. You are the fruit that you need to take care of. See, the thing that you need to take care of, listen to me, is not those bills getting paid and you get more money in your bank. That ain't the fruit. The fruit is me. With this fear, this fleshly emotions, and it's not fixed. I need the fruit, not the bills. God called it first fruit. That's how important he thinks you are more than your money. He thinks you're more important than your house. He thinks you're more important than receiving love from family and approval from other brothers and sisters in Christ. He thinks you're that important. 
and you're that fruit that's most precious to him, that he wants you to care. And that was the purpose of trial and affliction is so the fruit which is you can finally be brought forth and give birth to such good fruit. But during all that time, your tree has been withering and dying and you've been working hard on other trees and other fruits and some of you have won hundreds of fruits, brought hundreds of fruits, but here is your own tree withering and dying. And how can a withering, dying tree keep producing other fruits? But when that tree is well watered and it produces much fruit and it is fruitful, it will be healthy enough to scatter more seeds, lose more fruit, get afflicted again, get scattered again, because that tree is fruitful. It's very fruitful. It can take a beating. And it can lose a couple more apples. It can lose more corn of wheat and let them fall into the ground and let them die, let them burn, let God take it away so that he can produce the hundredfold fruit that you've been waiting for all that time. You want the hundredfold fruit. What's more important than that is you. And if God never even gave you a hundredfold fruit, at least your tree is fruitful. And you can have the love, joy, and the peace that you desperately yearn for all that time because you're the most important fruit. When you come on this altar, when you take opportunity to pray, I hope you'll realize the most important thing now is not your brother and sister in Christ or that your problem goes away or that God gives you a job or he finally answers your prayer or that he fills up every seat in this pew or that the infliction and the trial will be something that he can minimize more or at more fruit this and hundredfold fruit that but more so of it's me God I come down because of me I'm withering I'm dying oh God Oh God, make me fruitful. Water my plant, please. Oh Lord, take care of my tree. Oh God, if you have to prune off the crude branches, please prune them off. Oh God, my fruit you've taken away to scatter. Oh God, let it happen. Oh God, take care of me, please. Is your spirit in you crying out? For years, years and years, what it's been waiting for, yearning for, but you never fed it, you never watered it, you never gave a flip or a care about yourself. Is it now time that it can finally get the sustenance that it needs? And that it that needs the sustenance is you. Every head bow and every eye shut.